Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hey everyone, hello. Welcome to Attitude's ADHD Experts Webinar Series. I want to welcome all of our listeners, whether you're listening now to the live webinar, whether you're listening to the podcast version a few months from now, or watching the webinar replay, um, I think you'll find the topic of how moms or dads, for that matter, with ADHD themselves can manage the challenges of creating a successful home life for your child with ADHD. Um, I am so pleased to welcome back ADHD expert Carrie Matlin. She was one of our very first ADHD experts on our when we first started this webinar series, and um, she has invaluable experience raising a child with ADHD and offering strategies and tips that work for her and her daughter. So, Carrie, thank you so much for coming back to Attitude. Um, let me introduce Terry first. I think that you may see, I'm going to see where we are here on the slides. You may see a slide. Oh no, this is the, with the wrong um, bio on it. So I'm going to tell you what Terry's interesting bio is. She's a psychotherapist. She's an author, consultant, and coach. She's really one of the leading experts on women uh, with ADHD and the author of a great book, which I recommend to you called The Queen of Distraction. And another one, which I love also, which is Survival Tips for Women with ADHD. It's got some very specific, wonderful tips. Um, she runs a website called addconsults.com, which is an online resource for women with ADHD, and also an online coaching program for women with ADHD at queensofdistraction.com. So, Terry, thank you again so much for being here. Um, one thing I wanted to say before Terry starts is um, if you're a podcast listener and you would like to visit the webinar replay page on Attitude Mag to see the slides that accompany this presentation. The way to do that is to go to our website, attitudemag.com, put Matlin, Terry's last name, in the search box, and then you'll see the option to, um, to uh, uh, fine-tune your search according to webinar replay. You'll see that in the box up on the left. So if you do that, the web page will come up. Um, for this webinar, and you'll be able to access the slides if you're interested. If you're interested in the attendance certificate, please wait till the end of the webinar. Look for the questions March required for a certificate. At the end of the presentation, in both the live and replay versions, complete these, and you'll receive a certificate by email. So we're happy to have that new service available to everyone. Thank you all for being here again, and let me turn it over to Terry. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for inviting me back. I always love doing projects for you and for Attitude Magazine, and I would suggest everybody hop onto your website because I refer many, many people to the wonderful resources that you have because you guys are the best. So thanks again for having me. So let's jump in because I have a lot of material to cover, and I realize that I might have a little too much. So at times I'm going to kind of jump around quickly and as Susan mentioned, that there is a replay so that you can um, go back and slowly go through my slides if, if you need to. But I wanted to add that I have two daughters, and I now have two. They're actually young adult daughters, but I went through a lot of difficulties raising these two girls, one of them that does have ADHD, who I'll be talking about during the session. But I also want to add that I also have ADHD, and I think that's helpful for people to hear because a lot of people will say, well, how do you know what I'm going through? Well, I don't. I don't know exactly what you're going through because each family, each parent, each child is obviously different, but I do have a pretty good idea of the general challenges that moms and dads, parents have when we are raising kids with ADHD. So because I have it so much in my family, in myself, obviously, and I work with women with ADHD, I see... Uh, see this from many, many angles. So um, let's get going. And I want to first talk a little bit about me because actually I was asked to, to be a little transparent about my own life so that maybe you can see that even experts, so-called experts, um, don't, we don't always have the answer, but we do have the understanding, I believe. So let's get started with how I got involved in helping um, women and moms with ADHD. Well, as I mentioned, I have two daughters, one with uh, severe ADHD. And when she was young, I thought that um, I was 
just totally incompetent as a mom. Both of my kids, when they were young, were very high energy. They were loud, active, but I um, have the inattentive subtype of ADHD, and I won't get into the subtypes too much. It's not for this uh, particular webinar, but basically what I'm saying is that our, our, um, our, our types of ADHD were vastly different from each other. So it was a difficult time for me as someone who was kind of spacey and lethargic to manage two extremely active kids. So my youngest, whom I'll be talking about, had a life-threatening illness as a toddler. She actually developed encephalitis after a, uh, a vaccine injury, and it left her with um, a lot of residual problems, including this very, very severe ADHD. In fact, it was so um, difficult that there had to be two adults at all times with her just so that she wouldn't accidentally hurt herself or worse. She couldn't sit still. She couldn't sleep. Uh, as a matter of fact, just to get her down for a nap, this is when she was, uh, she got sick when she was 16 months old. So we're talking toddler. Toddlers generally take, you know, one or two naps if you're lucky. If you have a toddler with ADHD, that may not be the case. But in order to, just even to get her to nap, I would have to lay my entire body down on hers on her open crib. And when I would get maybe 20 minutes of rest. So it was a very, very difficult time for me. So some other examples of, of my own personal challenges. Well, people say, and I'm sure some of you have heard the same thing, how can you possibly have ADD when you've had so much success in your life? And my response is, well, I was <laughs> kind of, I was lucky in that I am a social worker and I'm in the field of mental health. And in social work in particular, we are trained to reach out and find resources. Who is out there to help our clients? Who do, who, who do I call? Where do I find help? And I was able to utilize those skills in helping me help my daughter. So that's one thing that might set me apart quite, you know, somewhat from other moms uh, because it's, it can be really hard to figure out where to go and where to find help. That doesn't mean it was easy for me because it wasn't, and it still isn't because even at her age in her early 30s and with her other special needs beyond her ADHD, she still needs a lot of parental help. So backtracking just a little bit more, I wanted children more than anything in the world back then, and it took us seven years before we were finally adopt, able to adopt our first child, and that's when I began to hit the wall before having kids, I was able to compensate fairly well, but once the baby came, there was automatically that lack of sleep. And I don't care if your child has ADHD or if you have ADHD or not, that lack of sleep makes it extremely difficult for all parents. But if you're a mom with ADHD, uh, we really need our sleep because we expel so much um, of our energy just getting through the day. So I found that the very, very beginning, I just could not cope. My oldest daughter, the one that we adopted first, obviously, had um, colic, and I just couldn't cope with that uh, sensory overload of her nonstop screaming. I think that lasted, I think it was around three months. So I felt like the absolute worst mother in the world. And then later with two young children, I just couldn't deal with the nonstop demands, the crying and the meltdowns. The daily uh, chores of the nonstop laundry, putting meals on the table. I couldn't understand how other moms seemed to manage so much better than me. What was wrong with me? And on top of that, uh, we're talking about the 1980s, late 80s. I was a stay-at-home mom. I chose that. I could have gone back to work. Um, luckily, financially, I didn't have to. So I was very fortunate that I could make a decision either way. And I chose to stay home with, with young children. But, you know, I've heard from many moms with ADD that being home 24-7 with a child with ADD is harder than working because um, we're, you know, we're, we have set, when you're at work, you have set expectations and deadlines. and You know what you need to do, when it's due. doesn't mean it's easy, but there's that external uh, help that keeps you on task better than when you're at home. And when you're at home, you know, well, when you're at work, you know, you often get feedback like, oh, you're doing a great job, I'm going to give you a raise. But when you're at home, no one pats you on the back for having an organized spice cabinet or that uh, the children's clothes are folded and put away weekly. Now, weekly is 
sometimes stretching it when you're a mom with ADHD, and it could be monthly or never. You know, a lot of us just can't take on some of these household tasks. So every new milestone with my kids was like a horror story. I had a headstrong firstborn. Body training was a test of wills. My own intensity about doing it right made it so wrong. I was really kind of a tense young mother because it was so hard. I didn't know at that time that I had ADHD, and I wanted to do my best. I couldn't understand why everything was just so hard. So I had a hard time living up to my own expectations of being that so-called good mother, and it really felt like I was in a circus trying to juggle like a hundred different balls in the air at once, and I felt like such a failure, and I actually went through some bouts of depression and thinking, you know, is this supposed to come naturally? It sure isn't coming naturally for me. I couldn't figure it out. And the other moms that I knew, I'd look at their diaper bags. We'd go out with the kids for lunch. Their diaper bags were so organized. Their clothes in, in, in the baby's room were hanging one inch apart in the closet perfectly. The winter clothes that they purchased, they purchased them in the fall, they were so together, and I kept saying, well, what is wrong with me? Even just getting them into their snow suits, I remember, was just exhausting. They were both so hyperactive. They couldn't sit. They couldn't snuggle. And my dream about being a mom was being a snuggler, you know, having kids surrounding me on my lap reading books, and my kids were up and running around me yelling, screaming, singing, screeching. So it was a real total mismatch in temperament. I didn't know how I survived, but uh, learning about my youngest and how to help her with her ADHD is what caused me to discover that I had ADHD. So I was diagnosed in my 40s, and that happened in a really strange way. I was trying to figure out how to help my youngest daughter. So I was reading as many books as I could. Now, back then in the 80s, believe it or not, there were very few books out on ADHD. It's nothing like it is now. And somehow, somewhere, I don't remember how, I fell upon a book by Dr. Lynn Weiss, who I think she must be retired now. I don't see much coming from her anymore. But she wrote the very first book on adults with ADD. So I just grabbed that book out of just plain curiosity. And as I was reading, I saw me. I saw relatives. I saw all kinds of people in my family. And that turned the light bulb on, and that's when I went to... Um, get an evaluation, and find out, found out that I did indeed have ADHD. So it's been a very difficult journey. It took its toll on me. It took my self-esteem right down into the toilet. So basically what I'm trying to express right now and share with you is that I can relate, truly I can, to your situations raising kids, mainly kids with ADHD, but it could be kids without ADHD. Just being a mom with ADHD makes all of this so, so difficult. So Today we're going to talk about the special challenges that moms with ADD have, parenting kids with or without ADHD, and I'll be sharing some tips on how to live better with ADHD when it's uh, part of the picture. So let's get started. I've been blab, blab, blabbing because I wanted you to see that uh, um, you know where my my experience came from and how I, I feel deeply for you and how this has affected my life in a professional way, and I wanted to uh, make this my life work. So let's get started with the first slide. Um, it's, is this you? If any of these questions resonate something within you, then, well, then you're at the right place. So we're starting with, why am I unable to sit and play board games with my kids? I remember as a child, that was my favorite thing to do. I love playing board games. But as an adult and as my ADHD changed, and it does change from childhood into adulthood, I couldn't do it with my own kids. And why can't I obtain an, a college degree, and yet I, can't, I couldn't figure out, and I still can't at times, figure out what to cook every night, let alone remember to get the ingredients that I needed at the grocery store? Why does the sight of a pile of dirty laundry make my heart palpitate? Why do I have panic attacks in the grocery store? Or worse, oh my gosh, in the mall. I didn't understand all those years walking into a mall and just wanting to run out. Now I do. I understand. Why can't I get my kids to sit through dinner? And I'll be talking about that as well. And how can I juggle working and raising my family and everything else with ADD in the picture? So we'll be talking about this, and, of course, there will be time at the end for questions and answer. And to remind you, I still struggle, even with my older one um, who does need you know, some, uh, some hands-on help. I don't have all the answers, but I'm still learning. 
So even experts like me and others that uh, Attitude Magazine has on these webinars, here's an example of, of how I screwed up big time with my younger daughter. Um, I never learned to sew. I remember going to, in middle school, in those days, we had to take home ec, which included sewing. I didn't know what a bobbin was. I didn't know how to put thread in a sewing machine. I didn't pass uh, sewing or all of these uh, related kinds of classes. So fast forward, my daughter was in brownies. And you know how with brownies, they wear these cute little brown vests and they'd earn badges for whatever. And you're supposed to sew those badges onto the vest. Well, I had no patience, let alone the ability to put a thread through a needle. To this day, thank goodness, my husband is actually very good with that kind of uh, uh, hand-eye uh, coordination, so I make him do any kind of sewing. I just can't do it. So being uh, someone with ADHD, as many of you, we tend to be creative types. There's not really a lot of research backing that up, and my theory is that we have to be creative. We have to learn creative ways to get through life. So my creative solution in helping my daughter with all of these badges she came home with was, huh, I'll just staple them on. I thought I was brilliant. So I stapled them on, and I thought, wow, that, that works, until one day she came home crying because the staples ripped through her skin. They went right through the, uh, the little vest. She came home crying, and her skin was bleeding, and I felt like, again, the worst mom in the world. So the purpose of this presentation is to help you moms with ADD to cope with these everyday kinds of situations that really seem so easy for other moms to handle but are so difficult for us. Because as moms with ADD, we feel that we should be able to have that uh, clean house, just, you know, perfect-looking rooms, well-behaved children, hold a full-time job like everyone else, and to do it well, but that's just not the case. What we need to do, and this is really important, is we need to reframe who we are, and we are moms with an ADD brain. Our brains are different. So what we need to do, and I can't emphasize this enough, is to change our internal expectations and shift our strategies to make ADD work for us. And a lot of this I learned many years ago when I was just in the process of being evaluated and treated and learning how to deal with ADD before I got into the field was I read a book by Sari Solden called Women with Attention Deficit Disorder. And I would encourage every single one of you on this call, on this webinar, to, to get that book. Uh, she's since uh, written, co-written, um, and it's a new book called The Radical Guide for Women with ADD. And I would encourage you to get that as well. The fact is there are over 4 million women with ADHD. The sad news is that most of us, most of you, most of them, haven't been diagnosed, or if you have, you have been misdiagnosed. Generally, what I see are women who have been misdiagnosed with depression. Now, many times um, there is depression seen with ADHD, or ADHD can cause someone to feel depressed even if they don't have a clinical, depress uh, clinical diagnosis of depression. But... In general, most women go in for help to their medical uh, psychiatric providers are not getting the correct diagnosis. So that's something to keep in mind if you've been uh, getting the sense that maybe you have ADD, um, but you're not getting the diagnosis, go for a second opinion. Sometimes it takes three or even four. I actually went to four different clinicians when I first did get the diagnosis of ADD. My story might be a little different in that I didn't believe it. I thought, I have some kind of character flaw. There's something wrong with me. Can't be ADD. The ADD is for kids. So take the time and, and, and research this for yourself and realize that ADD is a real medical condition. It is not a character flaw. And you might want to take a screenshot of this slide so that you can take this to your uh, health providers if people are not uh, believing you that it is truly a medical con condition. It's not something all in your head. So my point is it's time to start shifting our strategies. And when I say we need to change these strategies, here's an example. Um, I have some pretty significant hypersensitivities. And we see that a lot in ADHD regardless of what age. You see it a lot in kids, kids who won't wear blue jeans uh, because they can't stand the feeling of, of the 
the seams and the tight uh, waistband. So my hypersensitivity has affected me in a great big way as a mom with ADD. So, for example, uh, you know, we're told, we read, we hear that the right thing to do as a mom, just period, as a mom, is to have dinners together as a family. It's like a uh, like the golden rule. And I say, geez, the hell with that. Sometimes it doesn't work. If ADD is in the picture, that may not work. So in my case, when my daughter with ADD was quite young, uh, she had what I called active eating. She couldn't sit still. And I used to time her. And I remember it was like five seconds that I could keep her sitting in a chair. And if I could get her in the chair, she'd be falling off the chair. She'd be throwing tantrums. She'd be banging the plates and the utensils. She caused such chaos that it was a very unpleasant experience having a family dinner. And I thought, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong here. And at the time, we were working. Oh, I forgot to turn off my phone. Let me turn off my phone. So, thank you for your patience. So, turn off my phone. Um, so, I was seeing, uh, working with a psychologist, and he said to me, and I'll never forget this, and I'll pass it along. He said, why are you forcing her to do something she is unable to do? And that really struck me very deeply. And I thought, yeah, why, why are the things that I'm reading about what moms should do, what families should be like, take precedence over what her needs are? So our, my change in strategy in this case was I put her in another room where there was a TV, another real big no-no, right? But in our case, this is what worked. So we would turn the TV, put food in front of her, and she ate. When she was at the family dinner table, she couldn't. She couldn't sit down. She couldn't eat. She was very thin, very hyper, but she was distracted by her TV and was able to eat and made everybody happier. So let's get into the uh, characteristics of uh, ADHD, and I'm just going to kind of rush through this because I, I'm uh, running, going to run out of time, and I really don't want to do that. So are you physically restless, bored, easily bored? Are you a procrastinator, disorganized, lethargic? These are all very common traits and symptoms of, of adults and kids who have ADHD. You might be hypersensitive. We talked about that, sensitive to touch, noise, and commotion, which makes it a very big problem when you have little ones jumping all over you. You might find it just really difficult to tolerate. And you might be able to hyper-focus on things that are of interest to you, like Facebook. You can lose hours. I know I can. On Facebook, now Instagram is a big uh, attention grabber for me. I have to really be careful with that. For some, it's TV. A lot of women with ADHD have more significant PMS symptoms, and I'll talk briefly about hormones and ADHD. It's very important for us to be aware of that. I'll talk about that later. Um, but I want you to really think about this. ADHD is not an excuse. It's an explanation, and that's another thing to maybe write down or take a screenshot and use that and even carry it in your purse because I know from my own experience people saying, Oh, it's all in your head. Well, it's not, but it does explain what's going on with you. And here is how a lot of us, and I sure felt like this many, many, many days. We're going to talk about some special issues that mom with ADD face. We have so many responsibilities. We're integrating societal expectations of doing it all and doing it all in a certain way and being that perfect mom. Again, this comes right out of Sari Solden's book, and it's also, I talk about it in my books. You know, women are seen in general as the caretakers, so we're expected to oversee everything, direct things, make sure everything is okay. In general, now dads are now stepping up and doing more of this, but uh, we're not quite there. And we just don't get enough help, so it becomes a very difficult situation, and we're experiencing tremendous amount of stress, too, if we're also working parents because we have, like, two lives, the life at, at work and the life of coming home as a mom. And uh, stay-at-home moms, those days for you are so unstructured. We don't think of this in terms of, well, it's very different than if you're working because now we're on our own. And it's, I think, a lot harder in some ways because it's, it can also be very boring. We don't do well with repetitive tasks that have to be done every day, like laundry, meal planning, 
uh, you know, laundry, and then there's the constant interruptions of children wanting our attention, and we don't get that positive feedback. No one says, oh, you know, your cupboards are so clean, I'm so impressed. No one says that to us. Then there's the high noise level, and, of course, genetic. Uh, play, genetics plays a big part that if you have ADHD, a very strong possibility you have one or more kids with the ADHD. And then there's the hormonal changes, which is so important to understand. Um, I can't get into it too deeply. We don't have time, but it's important for you to realize that when you have ADHD, any kind of hormonal change often, often increases your ADHD symptoms. Dr. Patricia Quinn has been writing about this for many years. I think she's now retired, but you'll find a lot of work that she's uh, written and talked about online. And she talks about how uh, from men of perimenopause, and that can happen even in your 30s. So that means you, you might still have young children at home, and you're starting at the very beginnings of perimenopause, perimenopause of having symptoms which makes life so much difficult but more difficult for many of us and then going through menopause because what happens is there are changes in your estrogen levels and as your estrogen levels go down, symptoms go up. Not for everyone, but I hear this over and over again that it can be extremely difficult for many women with ADHD. And yet here we are. We're supposed to balance everything. We're still the ones that are setting the tone in relationships, keeping everyone in balance. We may have uh, difficulties communicating our needs to our partner, keeping our end up in disagreements. We can be oversensitive. I know that attitude has had Dr. Dodson because I saw this slide early on of his uh, bio. And he talks about something called rejection-sensitive dysphoria, uh, RSD, which really is uh, being you know overwhelmed with internal feelings of uh, perceived rejection. We just happen to be a sensitive bunch. So uh, go back into Attitude and find that webinar because he does some really good work in that area. And then briefly, single women. Uh, single women often say to me, well, what about us? You know, we don't have a partner or a husband or someone in our lives to help with kids. And, and I do feel for you because it is harder. And in, in other realms, it's, it's for women uh, who are single, it can be really tough sustaining relationships because... Um, of the difficulty sometimes with having a commitment to one person because it can be boring. And when you bring in the low self-esteem, uh, it can cause problems with relationships. And I'm sure there's other webinars to discuss that. I don't have time to do that here. So do as I say, not as I do. So let's take a deeper dive. If you're a mom and you procrastinate and you're overloaded with last-minute deadlines, well, then how can you help your child with homework strategies and not wait till the last minute? If you're disorganized, how do you help teach children organize, organizational skills? If you're hyperactive, how do you slow down enough to enjoy one-on-one -on -one, on one time with your child? If you're a daydreamer, how do you give enough attention to your child? Sadly, and I see this a lot, uh, the child may interpret that as you not caring. Well, we know that's not the case. And you may need to spend some time with a child as he or she gets a little bit older that, you know, you have ADHD and this is what causes, you know, sometimes where it seems like I'm not there for you, but I am. My heart is with you. My, my love for you, oh, there's no way to even describe how much I love you, but it may seem sometimes that I'm in my own world and I need you to, and then you can fill in the blank, maybe tug, uh, write a little jot, a little note to get your attention. And then if you're a mom who's overreactive, like a lot of us are, how can we be patient with a child who also might have a short fuse? And then again, if you're annoyed by stimuli, how do you cope with that normal bustling activity at home? That was so tough for me. I just really shut down more than once, and we'll talk a little bit about how to get around that. And here we are, super mom, and we'll talk now about general tips about how to manage living with ADD, and again, uh, society's expectations are so many. Uh, having a perfect home, getting meals on the table, managing holidays, uh, calling the doctors and dentists for appointments for the whole family, uh, setting up holidays. And there is so much that we do that we kind of take it for granted. We don't even sit down and think, wait, gosh, how do I do all of this stuff? So what happens is we internalize all of these expectations, and if we don't feel like we live up to them, we do get depressed. We feel empty and angry, and our self-esteem uh, takes a hit. 
And there is that sense of shame, which is another very important point to think about, the shame. And there's a lot being talked about with, uh, I know, Sari Solden and her partner, um, Dr. Michelle Frank, talk about this in their new book. The sense of shame and a feeling of failure of, why can't I be a better mom? So let's look at this acronym, which I like, EASE. We need to ease into our ADD. So the acronym, as you can see, stands for educate. We need to educate ourselves, accept ourselves, and we need to celebrate our strengths, something that we don't do enough of. Okay, so we have a hard time getting meals on the table. We have a hard time getting our work done by the end of the day. But what about the things we do well? And I wish after this is over that you jot down on a piece of paper the things that you do well, you might be a really good listener. You might be great playing piano. You might be a leader. You might be just a really sensitive soul and, and like to uh, volunteer and give of yourself. So continuing on here, we need to simplify our lives and eliminate over-commitments. So what I'm hoping that you can do right this moment, right this moment, please think about this. Give yourself permission to break that mold that mold of those expectations that we've grown up from since the time we were a, a young girl. Break the mold in order for your world to work for you and change your expectations of yourself. There is no right way to make a meal. There's no right way to organize your home, to raise your children, especially when you have ADHD, because if there were, for goodness sakes, there wouldn't be so many books written on these topics. There are a million ways of making things work for you. So I look at this picture, I just had to share this one, this perfect, what I call the perfect family. This doesn't exist, at least not in the people that I know, and probably it doesn't exist, period. But look at this picture. To be honest with you, I could just take my fist and punch that mom out. Uh, look at these kids are looking so happy. There's a perfect meal on the table, everything, even the spoons. I'm looking at it right now, perfectly situated in those uh, bowls and stuff. So um, I advocate that if you have ADD, it's okay to make some big changes. And one of them could be carrying out your dinner for Thanksgiving and other holidays or even eating out. Make it work for you. I keep repeating that. I don't have time to, to get into a story about my own holiday uh, mess, and some of you might have read about it. But I will say that to this day when there's a big holiday, I will order all the food in. I know it's extremely expensive but I make changes in my budgeting so that I can do this. So it's liberating once you let go of these expectations and make up your own rules. This is more of what you would see at my house. So unlike that smiling Thanksgiving family that you saw a second ago, this is what normal looks like for me and probably for many of you. I'm not saying that all of you have difficulty in the kitchen. In fact, I know a lot of women with ADHD who shine in the kitchen, and it's their way of being able to express their creativity. doesn't work for me, so I had to make changes. I no longer accept that these expectations are working for me, and, and I can't be the perfect mom. So it might be hard for you to read. I'm going to just really quickly run over, oh, run over, talk about uh, just what these bubbles say and, and why these are important. So how do we manage? Well, it's important to get the proper treatment, get the diagnosis. If you are on the call now and you think, oh, I don't have a diagnosis, I'm not sure what's going on, but I certainly can relate to the things she's talking about, get an evaluation, see if you have ADHD, and then get the proper treatment. And that could include medication, working with an ADD coach, getting therapy, support. Educate yourself and your partner and your family. Accept your ADD. That can take a long time. It can actually take years. You can even get to the point of where you have accepted, then you experience something that pulls you back down into the darkness of feeling horrible. And that can be very painful, and that's where therapy comes in. It can be very helpful. Delegate chores and duties. Use humor. In my house, you know, when I screw up, I don't like to use that word, but you know what I mean. I'll just say, well, there goes my ADD kicking in again. Simplify your life with meals, chores, and shopping. We'll talk about that later. Eliminate overcommitments. We tend to be people pleasers. I have uh, uh, an idea of what that's about. If we have time, I'll talk about it later in question and answer. But 
learn to say when someone asks you, oh, would you make 50 brownies for the soccer team? Instead of jumping in and saying, sure, I'd be happy to do that, learn to stop yourself. And it's hard, especially if you're on the impulsive side. Learn to stop yourself and say, let me think about it and get back to you. So I'm going to say it again. Let me think about it and I'll get back to you. And when you think about it when you're back home, you might say to yourself, I sure don't want to be uh, helping out and going on the school bus and helping with the, the field trip to the museum. I can't handle a bus full of kids and, and all that. It just doesn't work for me. Yep, that's me. And I want to talk briefly about um, individualized educational plans. That's an IEP. If you have a child with ADHD, there's a chance, not always, that your child gets an IEP, which is uh, getting special help in school. If a child, because of their ADHD, finds that they just need that special help, you might have an IEP, but as an adult, as a mom, as a parent, I suggest that you develop what I call an individualized living plan. Of course, now this is something I made up, so don't go looking up on uh, Google what this is. And this is a way to accommodate your ADD challenges, how to make things work for you. So let's talk about some of these, and a lot of them are in my books. But let's go right into soup. Superwoman. So keep in mind that the hallmark symptoms of ADD include, and there are more, distractibility, procrastination, disorganization. It's important and necessary to reframe the way you see yourself as a mom with an ADD brain, not someone who's, and I've been saying this over and over again, not someone who's stupid, lazy, or crazy. There's a terrific book by that title, by the way. So make accommodations for yourself just like we do for our kids in school who need IEPs. So now let's talk about the specifics. And meals is my favorite because this is where I have the most difficulty, or I did, uh, especially when my kids were younger. It's my favorite sore spot. I started out making roasts. Uh, I remember when I was newly married, I tried to make a roast. My husband said, well, that tastes like sliced wallet. Now, he didn't say it to be mean. Otherwise, I wouldn't have repeated that, and I don't know that I'd be married to him at this point. But we were joking, you know, and, and I no longer make things that I know are too difficult for me. But when my kids were at home, this is a true story. When they were young, I would wake up in the morning. I, I wasn't thinking about, will I get them to school on time? Will I have time to give them a decent breakfast? The very first thought that came to my mind in the morning was, what should I make for dinner? I felt like such a complete failure. So, this is what I did. I know that a lot of people cannot afford um, carrying out meals, and I'm not saying you do this every day, but it's what saved me. In a couple days a week, we did pick up meals. In order for that to work, like I mentioned earlier, I had to change out my budget. So, maybe we didn't go to the movies uh, every couple weeks. Maybe we didn't buy uh, an extra pair of boots or whatever, because for me, having food on the table for my family was essential, and it also helped my self-esteem knowing that there was something healthy and available for them. So carrying out was something I had to do. The POS plan, also in my book, I'll just go over it briefly. It stands for Plan or Starve. And what I did was I got index cards, and on each card on one side, I would write down the, a meal for one day, for one night. So... For example, it might have said uh, roast chicken, mashed potatoes, and salad. Well, I knew that there was no way at 4 o'clock, which is usually around the time I started thinking about what to make for dinner, that I could pull off roasting chicken, making mashed potatoes from scratch, and making a salad. So on the other side of that card, I wrote down, pick up a rotisserie chicken ready-made at the market, uh, pick up, you know, you can get these little uh, containers of ready-made uh, mashed potatoes or whatever, and then I would get a bag salad. This is what saved me. I just couldn't plan meals seven days a week, seven nights a week. Shopping at smaller stores. This um, is really helpful for me. I know, again, we get into the whole, well, I can't afford the smaller stores. So, again, it comes to, you know, what is more important in your life? Is it this or a new pair of... Uh, gloves for the winter, whatever. So what helped me is learning that uh, smaller stores I could negotiate uh, better. When I go to a supermarket for three things, literally three things, like milk, bread, and, and uh, let's say green beans, 
it's an hour and a half ordeal for me because I get distracted and I get overwhelmed. And then I think, oh, well, while I'm here, I may as well. And then I end up buying way more than I really needed to. So I got overwhelmed. Try and shop at smaller stores. And you know the layout. Go to ones that you know, that you um, are familiar with. Eat before the kids if you're overwhelmed and you start to shut down. Again, my kids were wild. And it affected me in physical ways, not just emotionally, but physically I started getting ill. I started developing GERD and irritable bowel. And a lot of us have physical problems because of the stress we have living as a mom with ADHD with kids. So what I learned to do at one point, finally, was to consider and sometimes having dinner with my husband after the kids had eaten. And why not? I know there's, there's that golden rule again. The whole family needs to eat together. And I say, if it doesn't work, why are we doing it? So let's move on to household tips. I know that we're running late, so I am going to kind of rush through this. You're always going to have a to-do list. Dr. Halliwell, Ned Halliwell, talks about just getting organized enough, and I like that idea. So delegating spaces in your house where it's okay to be messy, for me it's my entire upstairs, and I just find that it has like a psychological component to it where um, I know that it's okay to have mess in the house, even if it's one in one spot. Making it fun, um, I'm kind of going out of order. Making it fun with the kids, so we had like a 10-minute pickup every day uh, before night, before bedtime, where whoever got their toys in their baskets I had baskets for each. They won uh, five minutes extra of watching TV. Finding a home for all of your items. I hired a professional organizer who taught me this. I didn't understand it until she came in. And, you know, sometimes you can just hire someone for just an hour and learn so much. And maintaining routines, kids really, really thrive. So here's that happy family again that I could, again, slap their faces because that certainly wasn't uh, part of my life. And uh, I don't know how they do it. I don't know how anyone can dress in white when you have so much going on in a, an ADD family. So we're going to get into a few tips of um, how to do that. This is more what I see and what I hear about in uh, ADHD families. Not, Of course, not all families have kids who are oppositional and act out in this way, but that's what I see and hear about. So with many women who are ADHD, like us, we tend to be overreactive. We need either high, believe it or not, a lot of us need high stimulation. If you're hyperactive and impulsive, that might be you. But many of us who are more inattentive are overwhelmed with that. And we have a low frustration tolerance. So how does that affect us? What can you do about it? One of my favorites is solving solving problems together. So If, uh, let's say, your partner um, has a habit of tossing his clothes on the floor before he hits the sack, you might want to say, what the heck? Why don't you clean up after you're a grown-up, you're an adult? Why?" Instead of saying that, you can instead say, this is the problem, honey. When you throw, well, let's put it this way, when there are clothes left on the floor, I'm afraid I'm going to fall. I'm really afraid of that. What do you think we can do to solve this problem? So you can do this with the kids, of course. Also, with family battles, remove yourself from the problem. This is a great way to model behavior for your kids, that when they feel themselves ready to explode, they can eventually learn to isolate themselves in their room or in another room to calm themselves down. And if you feel yourself ready to go, then blow, go to your room, calm yourself down, um, deep breathe and all that kind of thing. Pick your battles. This is one that took me a long time. I would go freaking out because my older daughter, I'm the one without ADHD, she was always hot. Her temperature, her body temperature was always hot. So in the winter, we would go head to head. I would say, Kate, put on that winter coat. It's 20 degrees out. No, I'm too hot. I don't. And I wish I had learned this uh, earlier on. So I finally learned. I'm just going to hand her her winter coat. If she's cold, she'll put the coat on. She knows what to do. So, you know, ask yourself, is it really that horrible if your child runs out of, ho- out of the house with different colored socks? No. And then the IEP um, was a nightmare for me at school. Um, this may not work for you. It worked for me. I was able to get in my daughter's IEP all homework to be done at school, not at home. And when that didn't, before that uh, happened, uh, I did hire, like, high school kids 
to take over the whole homework nightmare because to me the most important thing about being a mom and having kids is the relationship. It's not getting A's and B's. It's not finishing homework. It's your relationship with your child. And listen before reacting. We have this tendency to jump in because our brain, even if our bodies are not hyperactive, our brains are almost across the board, no matter how lethargic, how inattentive you are. And we have this tendency to jump in, try to listen before reacting. So let's get into some personal tips, which I call self-survival. Get help. Um, Getting someone to help you clean the house. Maybe someone can come in once a month with a deep cleaning if it's too much for you to take on. It was too much for me. Getting babysitters, even if you're a stay-at-home mom, it can be too overwhelming to take on the kind of care that your kids need when you have ADHD. So at times I would ask a teenager, hey, can you come over for a couple hours and just play with my kid? Support groups, essential. You need to reach out. If you're in a town where there are no support groups, go online. I run a huge uh, group for women with ADHD, and you can email me. Let me give you my email address, by the way, Terry, T-E-R-R-Y, at addconsults.com. My Facebook group has 36,000 members, which says to me, oh, my gosh, even though I've been doing this for over 20 years, there's such a need for women to find support. Attitude Magazine has fabulous support groups with all different kinds of groups available for you. Remember something. Another thing for you to please jot down. Getting help is not a luxury. It's a necessity. Finding ways around uh, these things that we're talking about is not a luxury. It's not a luxury getting someone to come in and help you organize or help you watch your child. It's a necessity. Self-care, you've heard about this so much, but I'm going to emphasize a few things. I jog uh, when the weather is decent, which it isn't in the winter. I'm in Michigan. But I find that after I exercise, I my brain just clears up. I can think clearly. I can remember things better. I can get things done. Try and find, I know it's hard for a lot of us, try and find something that you can do. I started doing yoga about seven years ago. Another thing that helps me clear my mind and calms down my nervous system. Our nervous systems, for most of us, are a wreck. So yoga, meditation, I've done meditation. I can't do it every day, partly because I forget or I just don't do it. And a lot of you will say, I can't sit still for 20 minutes. And you know what? I'm not asking you to sit still for 20 minutes. There are a lot of different ways to meditate, including walking meditation, mindful meditation. There's a lot of information out there that uh, you can read, so I won't get into that. And giving yourself downtime. If you're a working mom, see if you can stop at a at Starbucks or a coffee shop uh, to catch your breath because you're about to enter your second world, which is more important than work. It's your family. So you need to refresh your brain and your body. And if you can't stop at a, a, at a coffee shop, then t- announce to your family ahead of time, Mom needs 10 minutes to wind down so that I can be available to you guys. And then go into the bedroom, lay down, do a little quick meditation, listen to music, whatever it takes to help you get ready for the next part of your day. So let's get into organizing. I know this is a favorite topic And you can see visual cues you've probably heard. I don't know the science behind this, but I do know that for most people with ADHD, no matter what your age, visual cues are extremely helpful. I once suggested to a mom I was working with to use that uh, white, what do you call those, white markers. And even, because she kept forgetting her things when she was leaving for work. She would forget her keys. You know, you've heard this story a million times. She forgot her wallet. So I said, on your windshield, on your car, write down the things that you need before you take off. Visual cues. Extremely helpful. Post-it notes. Put them everywhere around your house. In the old days, I would tell people, you know, put it next to your phones, but nowadays most of us are using a cell phone. But just keep post-its everywhere with a pen. And what I did when my kids were little is I had a notebook for each child. And if I, say, for instance, got a phone call from their doctor with instructions on medication, I'm not going to remember that. I jotted it down on a post-it, <coughs> excuse me, and at the end of the day, I would take each post-it note and just slap it into their notebook. Make sure you date it because otherwise you won't know, you know when did this happen. Uh, was this from a year ago or from months ago? 
one notebook per child, very helpful. Using timers, we don't have a great sense of when time passes. So if you get stuck in an activity, it's hard to stop. It's hard to start. So use a timer like in, in 20 minutes, I am going to get to this pile of paperwork. Set your timers. Here's a tip that I'd like to share that really helps me. It's, it's um, when you're working on, say, cleaning up, I'm going to use an example of uh, cleaning the kitchen, is to go clockwise. So in my case, I'll stare at the faucet, at the sink, start there, clean the faucet sink, and then I force my eyes not to look anywhere other than to the right of the sink and work from there, clearing off the counters and then keeping uh, or going around the room until I'm back to the counter, at which point I then start with the floor. Now here's the hard part. We have this need, this impulse, to when we pick up that piece of paper to put it in a different room. And if you do that, if you're like me and many others, you'll end up in the uh, basement looking at family photos or in another room watching an uh, opera. So the trick here is don't leave the room until you're done. And I'd like to add something because I heard this from a friend of mine and it really helped me when I find that I can't get started on something that's boring, repetitive, a chore that I hate work, whatever. Don't do it because you have to. Do it because you can. Okay, so let's talk very briefly about moms who are working. Flex time. Um, when are you most productive? Are you a morning person? I'm not. Some of you are. Most of you aren't. For some reason, a lot of people with ADD are more uh, night people. But if you have a ability to be on flex time, ask if you can go to work later or early, whatever works for you, and that's usually when uh, there are less distractions because you'll be wanting to be around, uh, not be around your coworkers so that you can focus better. Using the launch pad is um, preparing the night before, putting your briefcase, your lunch, your whatever you need for work right by the door or somewhere near the door, and do this for your kids too so that you're not running around wild looking for their backpack and their lunches, have a launch pad for each person in the family. It could be on the kitchen counter. It can be on the floor uh, by the door. Lastly, what is your style? Are you better at doing more than one project at a time, multitasking? I'm not, but some of you do better with that. Or are you better off doing one project at a time, finishing one thing before moving on to the next? So think about it. Jot it down. Are you better with working um, as a team, or do you do better working solo? So learning about what your style is, and we're not going to get too much into the workplace because there's more to talk about. So here we have two women. High fi Remember that uh, actually we are getting towards the end, but uh, we still have some some to talk about, some things to talk about. Remember to go with your ADD. Find ways to make things work for you. That is my mantra. What works for you? Change that internal dialogue. Use new strategies. Come up with new strategies. You know, after this webinar, sit down and think, well, I'm really having a tough time with this part that she talked about. What can I do instead? So my example of the dinner table, I, I put my daughter in a room with a TV, and that's what worked. Um, you're creative, all of you. I know you are. Come up with different strategies that work for you. So just real quickly, some resources. These are websites that uh, you'll be able to look at more carefully when you have more time. And you can see that um, there's a lot of resources out there now. There sure weren't when I first started with young children. Some books that I would recommend uh, are up here. I didn't get all of them on there. And finally, remember... My parting words, get the proper treatment. That is essential. Before you get the proper treatment, of course, find out is this ADHD that's going on. If it is, get help. And we talked about what kind of help already. Get support from people around you, your family, your friends, online. Go to conferences. You'll find me at the CHAD at a conference every year. Uh, you can find information at add.org and CHAD, C-H-A-D-D.org. Generally, the, the conferences, they now combine efforts and the um, conferences move all around the country. They change locations every year. It was just uh, in was it St. Louis. They're always in November. So make some kind of notation. Please, this will be the first time maybe for many of you that you're even around so many adults 
who have ADHD. Focus on your strengths. We don't do that enough. We talked about that earlier. Reframe yourself as a woman with an ADD brain. You're not lazy and confident or crazy. Get those words out of your brain as fast as you can. And again, re- embrace your differences instead of hiding behind them and feeling so horrible about them. So that's my story. I'm Terry, that with was it. great. <laughs> well, uh, you've got a lot of fans listening here who say that they really needed to hear what you have to say, and I they really so. feel so much better listening to, to your story. Um, I'm, we don't have much time, but I've got a couple of questions that I think are great, and so let me just try one. Um, Christina says, everything you're saying is exactly my life. Um, how do I get other family members, like my mother and their father, to understand that, um, you know, that to stop shaming me because of, of the difficulties of my life with uh, managing three kids, two of whom have ADHD? That's a, a question I get all the time, and it's an extremely really? difficult situation. Oh, yeah. So I don't have the magic bullet, but I can share some ideas. One is I think it's helpful sometimes to compare ADHD with other kinds of conditions. So you can say, well, what if I had diabetes? That's a real medical condition. Would you shame me because I can't eat sugar? Would you shame me because I have to uh, take injections or take medication for that? Um, And I would try Maybe diabetes isn't the greatest comparison, but find something that you think your family would understand. Encourage them to read something about ADHD. More than likely, they won't pick up a book that you recommend, but you can print out some articles, and and there's a a lot of articles about moms with ADHD and why it's so difficult to, like we talked about this past hour, just maybe print out a couple sheets or invite them to come to your home and see what goes on in the chaos. That, that you're dealing with and that how your ADHD impacts how you parent and stand up for yourself. And sometimes, you know, we don't need their approval. If they can't get it, you can't force them to understand what you're living through, just like anything else. So some of this may have to be an internal change within yourself to learn to just say, well, if they don't get it, I can't force them to get it. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's another question, which uh, this is a great question. Um, I'm a single mom dealing with ADHD with two kids. How, can, do you have any tips for dealing with the kids' teachers? She says, I'm constantly forgetting to sign papers and return them. Um, there's always some sort of, quote, funny hair day or cowboy day that I forget, and that reading log is my enemy. So, I mean, I think all of us can identify with this person and I'm wondering if you have any comments on, on coping with school, the demands of school for your kids. So I'm getting that, um, getting them to understand the mom is what I'm hearing, not so much the kids' mm-hmm. needs, but the mom's needs. Right, right. And if you're comfortable, and I actually did this with my daughter, because I ran into the exact same kind of problems for getting to sign papers and all that. If you're comfortable, I would disclose your ADHD to the teacher. Hopefully these are teachers who have some empathy. Teachers are supposed to have empathy. We don't always find that. But I would disclose, if I could, and feel comfortable that I have trouble. If you don't feel comfortable with saying, I have ADHD, you can use descriptions. Like, I really have a hard time um, keeping up with paperwork do you think you could email me uh, reminders or information that you need so my kids can go on these uh, field trips or whatever? I do much better with those kinds of reminders. Or can you message me a text message? Uh, I really want to be there for my kids and do the right thing, but those kinds of strategies would be really helpful to me. So it really depends on your personal um, situation, mm-hmm. if you're comfortable or not. That's a, great, that's a great suggestion, yeah. Um, did you find a calendar or planner that worked for you or that do you suggest one? Is there something, um, an organizational tool that um, worked in your life? Okay, here's how I answer because I get that question a lot too. If you noticed, there are a million different calendars and planners out so there. So many, right. Yeah, many, many, many. What I had to do was kind of experiment and figure out what worked for me. And what works for me may not work for uh, our person asking the question. I'll tell you what I use. My system is I buy a teacher planner because they have these big boxes. 
And I don't like where there's lines where you have to fill in at 12.15 at 12.20 and all that sort of thing. That's too restrictive for me. What I like to do is just jot things in my big planner, and I take it with me everywhere. It's a monthly planner because then I can see the entire month. That's one strategy I use. I also have a regular notebook that I keep. See, I work from home, so it's easier for me. I keep it by my phone so that when I get phone calls or if I need to remember something, I can jot it down in what I call my main notebook. And then from there, if I can put that into my calendar, that, that planner that I'm talking about, I don't leave the house without that planner. That's my brain. We have to rely on these external uh, tools because we have uh, executive function and impairment, which we probably can't get into, but we need these planners. So what I would say is there is no perfect planner that works for everyone with ADHD. You're going to need to explore which one works for you. Some people just do really well with their phone calendars and Mm -hmm. all the different Mm -hmm. apps that are available. I know you've had a lot of articles on apps that work, so I will go back into Attitude's uh, website and, and see what works uh, for a lot of people there. And I think your point about it's very personal, trying things out till you find what's right for you is exactly right. There's no one answer for this. Um, uh, yeah. No. Um, oh, here's a great tip from Sally. She's about dinner. She, she said when her kids were young, she ate dinner while she was making it. <laughs> During the kids' dinner, she would read to the kids. It really helped. So that's a, that's a, cool. a solution that somebody came up with on their that's own. And then cool. Anne, Anne says, I am listening to this webinar while being on the phone, working on a computer, and also putting together a spreadsheet. <laughs> so there's a lot of people who are really identifying with uh, Terry's description of their lives. Oh, um, that's funny. That's funny. One last question. Um, I'd love this. How do I force myself to play board games when I find them really boring? <laughs> it's funny because originally on my slide, I, I used to have, um, when I spoke at a conference, I, I used that slide for board, and I, and I spelled it out B-O-R-E-D. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a couple of answers. One is, in my case, I just simply said to my kids, I can't do this. Let's do something else that we all can have fun with. And I would pick, mm-hmm. uh, like for me, it was activities outside because my kids were so hyper. They, they actually couldn't sit too well for a board game. But finding maybe some alternatives where everyone can have fun. If that's not the case and you really, really want to uh, play a board game, then set a timer and say, we're going to play a board game for 15 minutes. Then we're going to go on and do something really, really fun so that you can kind of encourage them to zip through that board mm-hmm. game because something even more fun is, is waiting for them. Interesting. Okay, great tip. And uh, finally, um, a question asking for the name of your Facebook group, which I think the, 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 the group would love to know okay, more about. So let, let me um, open up because I want to give you the exact URL for it. So give me one second because I have the computer on right in front of me. The name of the group is Women with ADHD, but there are two, and one is not the one that I run. So here's the exact, um, oh, that's the wrong one, the exact URL for my group, and it's, uh, so you have to start off with facebook.com forward slash groups, so it's a G-R-O-U-P-S, forward slash and this is all one word, women with ADD. So facebook.com okay. forward slash group Oops. forward slash women with ADD. Okay, and great. you'll find um, Yeah, that's fabulous. Terry, thank you so much, everyone. Don't forget to check out Terry's website, her Facebook group, and her books, which are just filled with really fabulous tips. I want to thank all of you for listening in. Don't forget to stay on and answer the questions if you'd like a certificate of attendance. If you are listening to this on podcast, go into the Attitude site, click, uh, put Matlin in the search box, and then you'll go to the, uh, the webinar replay section and you'll find this, her slide presentation, even if it's you know, months from the live webinar. Uh, upcoming next week, we have um, how exercise optimizes the ADHD brain. Terry talked about that, just touched on that in a bit. I think everybody at least in the attitude world, acknowledges that exercise is key. And then on February 19th, um, productivity tips with Linda Walker for adults, um, which I think this audience will also really appreciate. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. And thanks, Terry, so much. Thanks for coming. Bye. Bye. 
For more Attitude podcasts and information on living well with attention deficit, visit AttitudeMag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.